lot of cooking today is about equipment and what to do with it. But this is more of an issue of ideas and processes and how to apply them to food and flavor. This is not what you will see in every restaurant, short of maybe 20 extremely high-end restaurants all over the world, with a few in America. Um, what we basically do is find out the basic purpose of what is standard bench chemistry equipment and apply that technology to extract and flavor from fruit. It's important because a lot of the flavors you get from fruit today are artificial flavors. You know, if you use mint oil or basil oil or something, short of making it yourself, uh, you're getting a short window into the flavor of the plants. So when you use, rather than infusion, or different methods of infusion, you use elements like distillation, freeze drying, and things like that, you get a pure flavor. So the list you have, for those who have the list, is a list of the equipment on the table and the various technologies associated with them. We are, Rohan and I are going to cycle through each tool and explain what it does. We will smell some things, we will taste some things, so you understand the basic technology. Um, we, I stress that you should look at it as a, you know, at the end of the day, I am a classically trained chef. I want to make food that tastes good. I don't want to make food that looks good, that has good texture. I have no interest in making caviar out of apple juice. Some people like to do that. That's not really how I see food. You know, we are able to synthesize honest, delicious flavor that even the average person can see a difference. You don't need to have a trained palate. It smells better. It tastes better. It looks better. Is what we're looking for. And chemistry allows it, you to do that. You either believe or you don't. But it is true. Science is very quantifiable. Uh, so it's a, it's a role of process versus results. Everything we do has to have a functional use and a quantifiable improvement as opposed to a traditional method. Uh, very important to say that for those who have the means and resources, you cannot just randomly go on eBay and buy lab equipment. It's a very bad idea because most used equipment has probably been used for something in the biomedical fields or pharmaceuticals and God knows what, it has to be decontaminated you will kill your entire family and your friends. <laughs> Don't do it. You know, this is all new lab equipment that was specifically sourced for like research into food. Uh, in order to, you know, you look at everything up front, you understand the way to get it is to, to have an understanding of the technology and then using your knowledge as a cook in how you do things. You're like, okay, this is what it does. How can it make my life better? So it's about you know, applications of science to food. Uh, when you start to experiment with food science and trying to come up with things, I would also urge you, as soon as possible, to adopt the metric scale, even though Americans are very resistant to it. You need to start measuring in liters and milliliters. You need to weigh things in grams. Because there's no point doing an experiment if you can't reproduce the results. I know chefs just cook. We just make sauces, we just weigh meat, we just saute can tell temps of medium rare and all that stuff, that's fine. But when you're doing sort of more precise flavor and extractions, you do want to keep detailed notes and you want to measure and weigh your stuff. And buy scales and things everywhere. So we're going to start with, uh, not necessarily in sequence, with the most approachable and things that people understand, which is, you know, sous vide cooking. Number six, the uh, immersion circulator. Everybody knows it's just a controlled way of cooking certain proteins, bringing them to the right temperature, tenderizing elements of them, and then finishing with some sort of a sear, either in a pan or a blue torch. It's been normally expensive, because a uh, circulator would probably be in the range of $800 to about $1,500. Uh, so I worked with this company at Nova to develop this product. It's an actual circulating uh, Immersion circulator that is being sold retail for $200. You can buy five of them for the cost of a polo science bath, and it works well. It's been tested solidly. You get the circulator, clips to any tank of your choice. Um, everyone understands the basic technology. Once you know the coagulating temperatures of things like egg whites, egg yolks, protein temperatures, medium rare at 53, medium well at 54, rare at 50. You can cook anything to be. In order to cook vegetables with a high level of starch and cellulose, 
they have to be cooked above 85 degrees to break down the starch. Things like potatoes, things like uh, other tubers, Jerusalem artichokes, maybe for a shorter period of time, but they have to be cooked because of cellulose at higher temperatures. Um, after we're done this, we'll do a little Q&A. I'm just going to cycle through the, the easy stuff first. Uh, so this is, you know, everybody knows what an immersion. This is a bath with a circulator. This is a circulator that you could stick in any vessel and control the temperature. If you are planning on cooking over 65 to 70 degrees, there needs to be a lid on it because it does not maintain the temperature. There's, as you can see, there's a little tiny amount of evaporation and eventually it will lower the water line. So you want to sort of manage that. But otherwise, this you can run for 48 hours, cooking something like a pork belly. Certainly there are other traditional methods of doing that. You can use a combi oven, you can use a stove, you can use just braise in the oven. But in order to maintain a firm texture, uh, a skin that's completely cooked that comes out glass crispy after you sear it, I think sous vide does a better job of that. Uh, so there's both the process of preparing, bagging, cooking, and then chilling. You also can't chill it too fast because once you, if you just drop it into a bag into a bag of ice, it contracts, all the juices come out of the protein, and eventually when you finish it, it's a little on the dry side. So you want to do gradual step down cooling. Uh, we go on to the fun stuff, which is uh, homogenizing. You want to come and let's talk. Homogenizing is done one of two ways. This is this is what's called an ultrasonic homogenizer. It basically works as a blender, but it doesn't have, has no moving parts. It basically uses the same technology you would find in, say, ultrasound, by cycling sound at close to 20 to 30,000 cycles a second to do one of two things. It can explode the cell walls of solid matter, like vegetables, and once all that aroma and flavor is released, into any liquid medium. So here we have rosemary and maple syrup that's been infused for maybe one minute. The, the conventional way of doing something like this is that you would have to heat the liquid. You would warm rosemary, uh, warm maple syrup in a pan and throw in some rosemary or pour it over rosemary. But because essential oils are very volatile, within a minute of that, about 80% of the rosemary aroma would have evaporated into thin air. You'll have some change in your syrup, but you will have what is essentially like almost a 100% infusion of rosemary into maple syrup. So that's one of those things we talk about as a quantifiable difference in taste. And I think you should actually taste that to sort of understand the flavor. So in the whole process of making an emulsion, you know, like emulsions are things like salad dressings, or monte if you're doing something like a butter coach lobster. Everybody understands what we're talking about. Uh, the vermontane is made very carefully by heating up a little bit of water, slowly whisking in butter, till you get it to stabilize. If you go in too fast with the butter, it will break. You start all over again. If you heat it up too much, it will break. It's inherently a very unstable suspension. Doing it in this method, for example, there's one whole concept of flavor infusion, but the other concept is emulsion. Doing it in this in this uh, method, you get a completely stable emulsion that stays together indefinitely. You can bring it to a boil. You can basically boil vermonte. You can make vermonte out of any fat. You could use pork fat, beef fat. You could use brown butter. You could use peanut oil. You could use olive oil. You could use pistachio oil. And you know, we some of us classical cooks, we glaze vegetables with vermonte at the end, give them a shine, finish cooking them. So this just greatly expands your palette of flavors for doing something like that. You can butter poach or veal chop in water and hazelnut oil, in, which acts like a butter coating and get a different flavor. I'm going to get some water and show you what we are doing. Normally, if you take um, cold water, you know, the two basic emulsions are fat and water, oil and water, do not mix. Even in your most vigorous you know, you add olive oil to water as quickly as you can. It seems like it's emulsified. Within 45 seconds, there will be a clear separation of water and olive oil because the fat just cannot stay together. Even if you were to do it in a vita prep, blend it for two minutes. Within five minutes, 
it will separate again. You can't do it. So if you do it sort of ultrasonically, it will turn the oil and water into fine milky liquid that will stay like maybe the color and texture of milk indefinitely. Um, it's an interesting tool. It's handheld like this, just like a normal blender. If I turn it on, unless you have the hearing of a cat or a dog, you can't hear anything. But if there was some, some, some kind of creature with a higher pitch perception of noise like cats, it would be dancing all over the room right there. So, done. If you see that as I put the glass, there's movement in the glass, and that's just from sound waves. Sound waves can travel through air, but you can't see them. They can, you can see them in water because they will cycle and create like a wave effect. So once I put it in, it'll act like a blender and completely emulsify. So there you go. And you will continue to emulsify it until it completely is infused into the liquid. You'll get a basically a very stable suspension. So if you were to do something that's butter coached now, you can just set it at a different temperature from the breaking point and do a lot of interesting things. From the infusion perspective, you want to infuse your sauces with some of the more interesting volatile plants of the summer, anise hyssop, uh, lavender, uh, young cilantro. You can sonicate any herb flavor into any liquid. You can make a salad dressing that has no emulsifiers. Like we don't really want to have mustard in every dressing that we make. But the only reason we put mustard in salad dressings is because mustard is an excellent emulsifier. The same goes for egg yolks. You can make hazelnut vinaigrette with hazelnut oil and really good vinegar and salt and pepper. It's a clearer flavor, it's a purer flavor, it stays emulsified, and you don't need to add any cholesterol to it. So you're now in the world of making you know, an unanticipated vegan food, uh, vegetarian food, and the possibilities are endless. Uh, it is important that you do all of this stuff in glass because it's such a precise technology, it'll actually pick up the flavors of metal. If this was in a metal cup and I did that, it'll taste metallic. So you want to use glass because glass is fairly inert, doesn't have a flavor. It's only the flavor of what you have it. But metal, metal does have a flavor. How much? A few thousand dollars. How much too? It's about two grand. But it's used for so many different things. Don't laugh. A Paco Jet is four thousand dollars, and more than a few restaurants have them. And all they make is ice cream. This is a much more useful tool. So it's really a matter of diminishing returns and. Uh, what you get. Uh, for those who have read Modernist Cuisine, there's a whole element of food processing in how you mill and engineer like flavors and textures. You can use, you know, the Vitacraft is a great thing, the Thermomix is a good thing, homogenizing is a completely different technology. Uh, the best blenders or food processors <coughs> run at maximum, say, about 3400 RPM. Uh, a homogenizer will run at about 20,000 RPM. And rather than use a rotating blade that just basically chops things, you know, homogenization is really a much more interesting technology. I'm going to pass this around. So basically, if I have like olive oil, black olives and olive oil in a container like that, you can puree it within about 10 minutes into a uniformly fine puree liquid that's just black olive oil, black olive puree. Because it pulls in the liquid on either side here passes it down here and it shreds it. This is about one millimeter between these two rotating bits and it will continuously shred it until it just is a fine paste. You can look at the tolerance of that and pass it around. It's pretty heavy. So that's what's called homogenizer. It's present in your daily lives in yogurt with uh, milk. If we didn't homogenize milk, every day you open your milk container, there'd be cream and whey on the top. But even with that, there are um, other things added to it, like carrageenan, which is what really allows it to stay indefinitely past seven days. Um, next concept is uh, evaporation, which is, this is what's called a rotary evaporator. There are two sides to it. There is a water bath that generates the heat to evaporate, and there's a condensing column that will condense the vapors generated here. 
This is filled with ice. So that when your fumes hit the ice finger, they condense and they eventually drip down here. You know, rotary evaporation is used for standard laboratory distillation. What do you use it for? Uh, mainly to extract solvents, but flavors, flavor concentrates. Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of flavor houses or commercial flavor products, you see the essences. They are essentially vacuum distilled using um, industrial setup of the same industry. And basically, vacuum distillation means that once you if you generally try to distill something, you have to get it to a high enough temperature that you can actually generate vapors that will condense. But also in doing that for food, it's very tricky. If you're going to distill basil, and you put basil in water, or basil or green alcohol here, once it gets lost, the basil aroma also is very volatile and gets lost. So the way to do that is that they create a vacuum. Uh, if you understand that as, as you lower, you know, all the temperatures in your life, exist at the atmospheric pressure that we are now. Normal Earth's atmospheric pressure is generally uniform unless you're in places like Colorado, where it's much higher in the mountains. But as it comes down, so does you know, the boiling points, the freezing points, everything comes down with it. It's a uniform scale. So if you were to create a vacuum, in which case zero atmospheric pressure, you can literally boil water at 10 degrees instead of 100. And that's not hot, but it'll still boil. So it's, it's hard to explain to people the concept of boiling is very different from heating. It's not, they're not completely connected. So for example, if you were to boil something like tea, at 100 degrees you'll get a particular flavor you're very familiar with. If you were to boil tea at 10 degrees, you'll get tea, but it won't taste anything like tea boiled at 100 because it will not extract things like tannin from the tea leaves, some of the other bitter compounds, you'll get a completely different thing. It's almost like if you made iced tea in the summer and just put cold water in a glass jar and let it sit in the sun for like a day, it'll still steep, but it tastes a lot better. It's not as bitter. That's why people do cold brew Chemex coffee this morning. Similar thing. So, uh, knowing that that's what it does, distilling. What interesting, fun things can you do with it? You know, in the world of things like cocktails, making. Uh, I'll give you two examples of things we've done. We, you know, you take a bowl of water, uh, you put it in a smoker, and you just smoke the water. You get smoked water. And, you know, which in its own can be used for multiple other things. But now you take the water that's brown and smoky, you evaporate it under vacuum. You evaporate the smoke water under vacuum. It will evaporate and condense. Remember, we carry flavor compounds and the liquid, but we don't carry the color. You can't transfer color. So it will evaporate clear. So now you have completely crystal clear smoked water. What would you do with it? Wow. Think of multiple things. So what you would do with it in one fashion is you get a silicone mold, you make an ice cube. You make a big square, two by two inch ice cube, and you serve it with something like an old fashioned. So when you think of like your scotches that you use, your bourbons, you have a smoky from the barrel burnt taste of you know bourbon which lingers somewhat when it's very cold you can't detect the smoke but as your drink develops and it melts slightly it gets a little bit more smoky over time so that's an interesting application uh, you could take you know uh, the you can wash the flavors of fats through water or alcohol which is just another random chemistry fact that creates interesting products. If you were to take a pound of butter, cut it into pieces, put it in a pot, brown it like you would make standard brown butter, scrape the bottom to capture the burned milk solids, arrest the cooking in like a pot of ice so it's not burnt, just brown, pour it in a piece of Tupperware with a lid, you can use water, you can use vodka, you can use gin or tequila, just like 1750 milliliter bottle of any spirit, whisk it together, cover, chill it overnight. By the natural differences in viscosity, the fats will separate to the top, like when you make chicken stock or bill stock or anything. Carefully run a knife around it, take the butter out. You know, butter is a texture, it's a flavor, it's a viscosity. Once you take the physical butter out, you've taken the texture, 
and the cholera. But now you have a brown butter spirit. You can have brown butter water, brown butter tequila, brown butter gin, brown butter vodka. You taste it, you're like, this tastes like this butter. There is no physical butter in it because you just removed it. It will be an amber golden colored liquid. You could serve it with that. You can make a brown butter, any of multiple cocktails. Now butter becomes a component of flavor it brings. Uh, better yet, if you distill the brown spirit, again, you can distill it back into its clear state. So now you can do a shot of brown butter to kill it. That's not an artificial flavor. You can make a brown butter margarita, which I assure you is the best drink in the world. <laughs> I've had lots of it. It's really great. And you can, if you used water, for example, you can use brown butter water to be the basis of a brine for which you could marinate a chicken or a turkey and then roast it. And from a lab perspective, we try things in traditional ways and we try them in different ways. Like if I was just to put butter over a chicken and roast it, it will taste like a roast chicken. If I was to brine a chicken in a brown butter brine, it tastes very different and amazing. The same goes for if you use rendered bacon fat. You can distill the spirit out, keep the flavor, keep the aroma, and use it for one of multiple preparations. You're not always looking for dist distill it. Sometimes you're looking for careful reduction. One of the uh, one of the most common things we do in the kitchen is try to reduce things in the pan. And it suffers from multiple things. If you were to use a gas stove or an electric stove, if you if there was a way for you to see the 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 shape of radiating heat on the side of a pot. It creates a heat vortex around the pot. This is where you get like a scorching ring around the pot. And that kills the flavor of whatever you're doing. Like maple syrup, balsamic reduction you see everywhere. You wonder why balsamic reduction is never as good as balsamic vinegar. Because it's like basically burned all the time. Uh, so if you were to use careful evaporation, in which case it comes under uniform contact of heat. If you were to actually turn it on, the mechanical action is that that actually rotates, I'm sorry, that actually rotates and as it coats the glass on the upside, it creates a fine, a fine film of liquid that is evaporated onto the other side and condenses. So you get very careful reductions. When you reduce multiple things, reduce like everything on the planet, you get a completely different flavor. If you did something like Worcestershire sauce, it actually gets to a point where it becomes like bitters. And if you were to use that for like a Bloody Mary, it's a completely different flavor profile. If you did something like a good fortified sherry from Spain, done, you know, whatever PX, those kinds of wines, you get something that is more cloying, more interesting, but you don't get any of the bitterness of the burnt flavors. You could take very choice, interesting spirits that we know things like chartreuse, green or yellow chartreuse, oxido maraschino, um, any of those things, B&B, &B, distill the alcohol out, keep the base as a tincture to flavor multiple things. Like green chartreuse is particularly interesting because it's made out of about 17 to 20 different herbs. Uh, you see it in things like aviations, last words, other cocktails. The actual base of green chartreuse, just one drop of it after the alcohol is removed on vanilla ice cream, is one of the most transcendent flavors. It's just like all the aromas of the mountain and all the herbs and greens and trees and things like that. And you can use them both in sweet and savory preparations. So, any questions before we continue? Yeah, where do we get one? <laughs> there are multiple manufacturers of rotary evaporators in the market. Maybe about 50 different companies make This is like a standard tool of chemistry. There's probably one in every chemistry lab in the country. So you just go online and figure out who makes one that you can afford. Why are they wasted on chemists? <laughs> because chemistry makes your life much better in other ways. It's everywhere. Yeah. So, you know, obviously the modernist cuisine book is like a proponent of lab exploration into flavor extraction. Uh, as we were saying earlier, you know, yes, you don't see this everywhere. You won't see this in a typical restaurant kitchen. But if you go to places like the Avery, if you go to places like Alinea, Grace, the French Laundry, you're like, why is this food so good? What are they doing that I don't know? Besides having 30 cooks to actually make the food, they have a lot of toys and tricks to do things that you can't do. And that's what it comes up. That's, that's, that's the basic point. Um, this is an interesting concept I'll talk about. This is, uh, this is what, if you've ever heard of a freeze dryer, this is a freeze dryer. So, 
A freeze dryer is composed of two things. Actually, three things. This is the refrigeration part, which is the condenser that actually freezes stuff. This is a manifold to which you can attach several bottles in different directions on each of these ports, and what is in the bottle is what is being freeze dried. This is a very, very strong vacuum pump, which you need to do this in a vacuum because freeze drying is the concept of sublimation. Going from a solid state to a gas, like ice, like when you see ice melt, it turns into water and then it eventually evaporates. In this case, it goes from ice into thin air. So the concept of using freezing to dry is, you know, it was pioneered for the NASA space program, astronaut food, rehydration, a lot of things on the market are freeze dried now. Some herbs are, the really expensive herb companies freeze dry their herbs are supposed to dry them. The differences of from freeze drying as opposed to dehydration is that, again, just like we talked about in evaporation, with heat you lose aroma and you also get oxidation and you also lose color. So if you were to dehydrate basil, like you go to the store and buy dry basil, it's never green like the basil you grow because the color and aroma is there. If you were to freeze dry it, it would stay green and it would also smell like basil. Um, the basic technology is chilling something enough, creating a vacuum that water cannot really exist in and so that once you freeze it and you defrost it, the water is just gone. It's really that simple. And so you're left with just a shell of what used to be the vegetable. It presents a lot of interesting culinary possibilities. You know, something for example, so this is, uh, you know, you get, uh, everyone's familiar with cilantro. You use coriander in your cooking. Uh, when you, if you were to just take your scatter a pile of cilantro seeds into a reasonably fertile land, if you come back in two weeks, there will be cilantro plants growing all over the place. It's the easiest thing to grow. So cilantro will grow, like most of the plants, it will grow to a certain point where it starts to actually regenerate new seeds. And you get what are called green coriander seeds, which is the plant. Generally, they're dry, so they turn brown, and then they're ground, which is how you have ground coriander that you would have in your standard Indian food, masalas, curries, and everything. If you get them while they're green and you freeze dry them, you get a completely different product. This is dill. Like you grow a dill plant, you see that this is still reasonably green. I'm going to pass it around so everyone sees it. You know, it's just dill, like a dill plant. Once you take the dill, is something you want to harvest while it's tender, and you use it for things like gravlax. If it gets too woody, it's hard, it's dry. You can't really use it for anything else. It's just like fertilizing your soil, and it's dead. It's not useful. You know, as part of the value-added approach to food. You can harvest your dill green plants, freeze dry them, and all of a sudden you have hay. Like you know how you have all those plastic dishes, a lamb shoulder, a pork shoulder, chicken roasted in hay, whole benzina roasted in hay. You're not doing it in an aromatic hay, which adds more complexity, different flavor, much more delicious dish, different approach to flavor extraction, flavor pairing, and cooking. And it still has just like a, a light aroma of dill on it as opposed to just cooking with dry wheat, which makes no sense. I'm not quite sure why the English started that, but cooking in hay is an interesting thing. Yeah. Questions? No questions? You have to have questions? We're just done now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll touch on like one of the last things. Uh, as I said, I'm an advocate for people learning how to cook and make things properly. You know. We know that the one thing, the biggest luxury in a restaurant is time. You never have enough of it. Time and space. <laughs> so, if there are really interesting technologies to do things better, you can find them. One of the easiest ways, one of the easiest concepts in this whole science modifying food thing is uh, clarification and filtration. You know, everyone should learn how to make a consomme properly by making a really good stuff, making a wrap, letting it clarify, it's not that complicated, but it does require several detailed steps and some time. Uh, if you get, if you use a vacuum pump, there's various pieces of lab wear, like beakers that have a port on the top and the vessel is on the bottom, and there's what's called a filtration funnel. 
which is just a funnel that sits on it and has an air gap. And you can basically get different, what are called micron filters. They're basically glorified coffee filters with very specific densities. So like the higher the number of microns, like a, a 50 micron filter would look like this under the microscope, a 2,000 micron filter would look like that under the microscope. So the higher the number, the finer it is. So when you take a high filter, a high micron paper, and you pour like a liquid into a funnel with a with the paper underneath, it basically just sits there. Nothing happens. It doesn't have enough specific gravity to pass through the paper. But if you connect a vacuum pump to the beaker, it will just suck all of it down, but it also filter out all the sediments. So what you would have taken an hour to do making consomme will literally happen in two minutes. Just vacuum filtration. And that's what you would what I mean you use for Crystallization. Just crystallization. They would filter things and wait till it sort of spread it out till it forms salt crystals. Uh, you can use vacuum filtration to make your own sea salt because it filters out things to very high tolerances. So you can just basically get on a boat, go like 40 miles out from Cape May, get a bucket of seawater, bring it back home, vacuum filter it, spread it in a clear plastic container, and leave it in sunlight on a tent, like covered somewhere. It cannot be rained into. It will eventually separate, and all you will have left is sharp crystals of sea salt. Like, you go out and buy a mountain salt, it'll look and taste exactly the same. Except it didn't cost you $15 to uh, buy a box of salt and different about this. So that's how sea salt is made. And one of the things you should understand, in doing this research, you learn a lot of interesting things. Rosemary is something we associate as, a, as an herb, but the operative flavor, when you taste it in syrup, is pine. It's like a pine needle. It tastes like it's a transfer of pine aroma into maple syrup. And if you do, you can do things. If you if you actually use pine needles, it'll taste like menthol. So when you do things to much higher tolerances, you smell very different things from what you would think by using natural methods. So rather than using lab equipment to distill artificial flavors and adding it to ketchups and maple syrups, which is what you find commercially. This is using lab equipment to synthesize the actual flavors and use it in food or the process of cooking. And that's the exciting thing about how the science of food meets like the high end of contemporary cooking and dining. Somebody has that question. No, back. So I have a question about the olive oil. Yes. So when you uh, like put olive oil in a blender, mm -hmm. it gets bitter, kind of? It does. It gets kind of, yeah, it gets kind of... Is it with anything else? Yeah, Just if you're making, one? like if you're making a vinaigrette, yes. and you put it in too yes. early, and like you really blend it, it gets kind of bitter tasting. That's more of a flavor perception issue. Like when you taste oil on its own, you know, the pores in your tongue can taste fats in very different ways from liquids. You know, uh, and so when you emulsify oil with water, you'll get probably a little bit of a different perception of its flavor. If you're using an olive oil that's very young, that's very acidic, that has a little bit of bitterness, then you'll probably taste a lot more of that bitterness. I generally don't believe olive oil is the correct oil. I, I rarely, at the time I make a salad dressing with olive oil as a vinaigrette, that's not just olive oil and balsamic vinegar. Because then, the reason to that is that the sweetness of the balsamic balances that bitterness. If you see most classic French vinaigrettes, uh, are made with like combinations of oils. The French almost exclusively use walnut oil, white or champagne vinegar. They use shallots, they use mustard. So you won't necessarily detect all those bitter notes of what you would get from olive oil. Like make French vinaigrette with olive oil as part of it. It's not it tastes like bad salad dressing. The trace amount of naturally occurring compounds in really good unprocessed fresh extra virgin olive oil is actually ibuprofen that occurs naturally, in which, you know, there's still ongoing research in that in Italy and at Monell, but they, uh, it's been, as a preliminary conclusion, used as the reason why there's occurrences of much less inflammatory diseases in Europe, in the population, than there are in America. We eat worse food and we don't have enough olive oil. They eat food that's just as bad for the most part. But like the olive oil consumption per capita for Americans is probably about 750 milliliters a year. In Europe, it's like five gallons. Yeah. So 
that uh, there's a lot more to it. It's a larger conversation. This is just a kind of a fun way to look at part of it and start to uh, think a little bit broader. So like I started with, ultimately for our sous chefs, what we want to do is cook and cook better food every day. But for anyone who's reasonably interested in science and mechanics behind how flavors are created, there's a whole world of experimentation and knowledge out there that you know um, we, we we don't know and continue to see. You still need to understand how to cook, like how to make things the basic way, and then you adjust them to either clever ways for flavor preservation or color preservation or aroma preservation. You're so cool.